pastors, theology students, and congregation members all over the world whose hope is in heaven and eternal life, it is nice to meet you. My name is Kang Koo Young, a center instructor who's standing before you today having learned the revealed word from our Peter tribe leader among the 12 tribes of Shincheonji. Our tribe leader has learned the revealed word from Shincheonji chairman Lee Man Hee and testified to all that he learned. I too plan to testify what I've seen, heard, and perceived without adding or subtracting. Today, I'll be testifying to a lesson titled Introductory Lesson 14, The Figurative New Wine, New Wine Skin, and Olive Oil. Broadly speaking, there are two meanings of wine and olive oil in the Bible. First, there are the physical wine and olive oil. Wine was one of the main things the people of Israel used to consume at weddings. And olive oil was used to light up the lamp inside the tabernacle of Moses. Then, what are the meanings of the figurative wine and olive oil that borrowed the characteristics of the physical ones? Some of you pastors may already know this content, but some of you may not. So please pay close attention at this time as I go over the content once more. First, I'll explain the answer to the figurative meaning. The figurative new wine refers to the new and revealed word. The meaning of a new wineskin that holds the new wine is the new shepherd and their disciples. Lastly, the figurative olive oil refers to the word of testimony of a witness. Let me explain how these answers to figurative meanings of parables came out as we continue. First, let us read from Luke chapter 5, verses 37 to 39 together. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for he says, the old is better. Let me explain the background story to these words. One of Jesus' disciples named Levi, who was a tax collector before, held a banquet out of his joy of having become a believer of Jesus. Many tax collectors and Jesus' disciples attended this banquet. And as usual, the banquet attendees shared food together. However, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who saw this and criticized the disciples by saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus then told a parable about this in Luke chapter 5, verses 37 to 39. Jesus said in the parable, No one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. He also said that new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one wants a new wine after drinking an old one. What do you think about what he said? Do you think Jesus was really worried about the actual wine and wineskin that he told a story like that? Or do you think he wanted to introduce a new wine since people don't like drinking new wine? 
In order to understand the true meaning, we must first take a look at the meanings of the figurative wine and figurative wineskin. The figurative wine borrows its characteristic from the physical wine, which is made out of grapes that come from the vine. This is why we must first learn about the figurative vine, which is a grape tree that produces grapes, in order to understand the meaning of the figurative wine. In John chapter 15, verse 1, we can see that Jesus described himself as the true vine. It also says in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 7, that the vineyard is a house of Israel, and the plants of the garden, which are the vines, are the people of Judah. From these two verses, we can see that the figurative vine refers to a shepherd and the chosen people. If the meaning of a vine is a shepherd and the chosen people, what comes out of that vine must be the wine, right? Now, we'll take a look at the meaning of the figurative wine together. Let's read from Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 to 3. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the richest affair. Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. We can see from Isaiah chapter 55 verses 1 to 3 that God speaks through prophet Isaiah and tells people that there is certain food for the thirsty to eat, and that they should come and buy it without money, without any cost. Have you ever bought any food without any money? What do you think this food is referring to? It also says in verses 2 and 3, to give ear and hear that their soul may live. Through this, we can see that the food God brings up here, including water, wine, and milk, refers to food that is spiritual, which is the Word, and not a physical food. People eat physical food with their mouths, but the word, which is a spiritual food, is consumed by listening through our ears. Eating this spiritual food is what gives life to our souls. Hence, the meaning of the figurative wine is the word. So, the wine refers to the word, and where does wine come from? It says in Isaiah chapter 25, verse 6 to 8, that God prepares a feast, like a wedding banquet on a mountain. It also says that He prepares the finest wine that is aged at this banquet. If the wine is a word, what is the meaning of this aged and fine wine? We can see that it is the new and revealed word that God gives at the appointed time. Also, there are two kinds of spiritual wines. One is God's wine, and another is Satan's wine. God's wine can be further categorized into the old wine, and new wine. 
And Satan's wine is called the wild wine or the wine of adulteries. Now, let us find out the meanings of the two types of God's wine, which are the old wine and new wine. The old wine and new wine appeared at the first coming. So we can go to Luke chapter 16, verse 16 to understand what they mean. There it says that the law and the prophets were proclaimed until the time of John the Baptist. And after that, the gospel of God's kingdom is preached. God's kingdom is a kingdom of heaven, isn't it? The law of Moses was proclaimed for a very long time before the gospel of heaven began to be preached. Therefore, we can say that the law of Moses is the old wine and the gospel of heaven, which is preached after the law of Moses, is the new wine. In order to dive deeper into the meaning of the new wine, we can also refer to John chapter 1, verse 17, where it says that the law was given through Moses, and grace and truth came through Jesus. So, we can say that Moses' law, which was preached for a very long time before the word of truth, started to be preached by Jesus, was the old wine, and the word of truth that came through Jesus was the new wine. The prophecies of the Old Testament became open at the first coming through Jesus as they were revealed and testified. Since the Jews at that time had never heard of the revealed word Jesus testified, so Jesus' words his teachings were like a new wine for them. To summarize, the old wine at the first coming was the law of Moses, and the new wine at the time was the new and revealed word of the fulfillment of the Old Testament. However, the old and new wines weren't around only at the first coming. They appear again at the second coming. To understand their meanings at the second coming, we can look at Luke chapter 22, verses 18 to 20, where Jesus said he would not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Everyone, what comes from the vines? Wine comes from the vines. According to what Jesus said, this word could be drunk again once God's kingdom comes, because the wine refers to the word. Just as it says in the Lord's Prayer, that what is in heaven is fulfilled on earth, when God's kingdom comes, we can see that this time is referring to the time of Jesus' second coming. Let us read from Matthew chapter 26, verse 29, together to better understand the wine, which is the word, that is drunk again at the time of the second coming. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. As we've just read in Matthew chapter 26, verse 29, Jesus promised to drink something new. He said the location where this new thing is drunk is the Father's kingdom, and it comes from the vine. Therefore, we can see that he's referring to the new wine. So, the meaning of the new wine that is drunk at the second coming is the new and revealed word. 
and the old wine that had been drunk for a long time before this new wine came along was the gospel of the first coming, which was the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Now, let us take a look at the true wine, which is God's wine, and the wild wine and wine of adulteries, which is Satan's wine. We'll first learn about the true vine and true wine. Jesus called himself the true vine in John chapter 15, verse 1. Why do you think he called himself the true vine? This is because God is a true God. Jesus, whom the true God was with, must have also been the true shepherd, right? And it is the true vine from which the true wine comes. Then, what should come out of Jesus? Would it be literal wine? No, right? What came out of Jesus was the word of truth, which has life in it to save people's souls. We can find the expression that the word in the beginning was God, and there is life in the word in John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. We've also seen in God's Word, in Genesis, that it is also the fruit of life and the tree of life that bears the fruit of life is the true vine. This is why Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 6, that He is the way, the truth, and the life. The truth was testified through Jesus' mouth, and it was the new, revealed word of the fulfillment of the Old Testament. When we eat this word, our souls live. Now, let us take a look at Satan's vine, which is the wild vine and the wild or bad wine. We can see from a book of prophecy in the Old Testament, Daniel chapter 4, verses 20 to 22, that King Nebuchadnezzar of the Gentile kingdom of Babylon, the destroyer of Israel, the old kingdom of God's chosen people, appears. This king is described as a tree like a wild vine. Then, what does a king mean according to the Bible? We can also see in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, and find the expression a royal priesthood, referring to priests who are like kings. From this, we can understand that a king refers to a shepherd, a pastor who leads an offering of service and worship. Thus, we can understand that King Nebuchadnezzar represented a Gentile pastor. Wild wine comes out of a wild vine, and let us read Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 31 to 33, in order to understand the meaning of this wild wine in more detail. For their rock is not our rock, as even our enemies concede. Their vine comes from the vine of Sodom and from the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are filled with poison and their clusters with bitterness. Their wine is a venom of serpents, the deadly poison of cobras. We can see from Deuteronomy chapter 32 verses 31 to 33 that the grapes from the Gentile vines are bitter grapes filled with poison. It also says that their wine is the venom of serpents, the deadly poison of cobras. Everyone, what happens when someone eats poison? They die, don't they? Just like that, the words of false teaching that come from the Gentile pastors are the poison and venom that kill people's souls. 
There was also another type of food in Genesis that God said never, never to eat. This food was the fruit of good and evil. The tree that bears this fruit of good and evil is a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So we can say that it is a wild tree, a wild vine. The book of Daniel is a book of prophecy in the Old Testament. And as we know, the Old Testament prophecies are fulfilled at the first coming. Regarding this fulfillment, we can see in Matthew chapter 23, verse 33, Jesus refers to the pastors of that time as snakes and vipers. I'm sure you've seen snakes before, right? But the teachers of the law and Pharisees were people, and they were pastors of that time. They did not look like snakes. Ultimately, the words that the teachers of the law and the Pharisees spewed out were figuratively referring to the poison and venom that killed the souls of the people. Furthermore, we can see in Jeremiah chapter 51 verse 7 that Babylon was a gold cup in the Lord's hand which made the whole earth drunk. Since wine was in that gold cup, we can see that the wine was a wine of Babylon. What origin of wine do you prefer yourself? It also says that the nations, meaning all the people, drank this wine from Babylon and have gone mad. People who have gone mad are not stable in their minds. They cannot tell the difference between what is good and what is evil. The Jews who heard the false teachings testified by the teachers of the law and the Pharisees 2,000 years ago were not in their right minds. They had gone mad, so they could not recognize Jesus the Son of God who appeared right before their eyes and ended up killing Him. This is what we've understood from the history written in the Bible. But it wasn't just at the first coming that there were wild vines and wild wines. They also appear at the second coming. As we can see in Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 to 5, there is a strange woman with the word Babylon written on her forehead, holding a golden cup. It also says that this woman was sitting on a beast that had seven heads and ten horns, also sitting on many waters. Have you ever seen such a woman before? What is the meaning of a figurative woman inside the books of prophecies? Apostle Paul had said in Galatians chapter 4 verse 19 that he was in the pains of childbirth. It also says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 2, that he gave them milk, not solid food. Let me ask you a question here. Was Apostle Paul a man or a woman? He was a man, right? I too am a man. Even though Apostle Paul was a man, he said he was in the pains of childbirth and fed people milk. From this, we can see that although he was physically a man, he spiritually gave birth to and reared spiritual children after receiving the seed of the word as a shepherd, a pastor. But the woman who appears in Revelation chapter 17 is not an ordinary woman or an ordinary pastor. It says she's a prostitute. 
A prostitute refers to an adulterous woman, right? Being adulterous refers to the fact that this woman had a relationship with the spirit of Satan instead of God's spirit. So we can see that this prostitute is Satan's false pastor, not a shepherd of God. It is also written that the prostitute holds a golden cup with the wine of adulteries in it. The wine of adulteries refers to false doctrines, the words from the commentaries. Commentaries are people's own arbitrary thoughts and interpretations that attempt to explain the Bible. While there is only one God, one Jesus, one heaven, and one Bible. It is incredibly difficult to know God's true will if you look at the commentaries. It also says that the prostitute was sitting on a beast with seven heads and ten horns. This beast refers to a destroyer who appears at the time of the second coming. And for the expression of the many waters on which the prostitute sits refers to the people's multitudes, nations, and languages as written in Revelation chapter 17, verse 15. These peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages refer to today's denominations and churches of tradition. To find out more about the wine of adulteries, we can go to Revelation chapter 18, verses 2 and 3. There, a great city called Babylon appears, and it says that Babylon is the home for demons and a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird. The birds represent the spirits in the Bible. They are not God's pure and clean holy spirits that gather at the city of Babylon. They are Satan's evil spirits that gather at Babylon, the spirits that are unclean. It also says that all nations fell because of Babylon's wine of adulteries. And the kings of the earth, meaning the pastors, also committed adultery. Babylon's wine of adulteries refers to the false doctrines, the words of the commentaries that kill people's souls. Furthermore, in verse 23, it says, All nations were led astray by Babylon's magic spell, even saying that they married the devil. Shouldn't our bridegroom be Jesus instead? But it says that all nations married the devil. Aren't we in the midst of all nations? The reason God and Jesus told us these things is so that we are warned against what we should never consume at the second coming, which is the wine of adulteries. I hope everyone can clearly understand this. Let us go over what we've shared so far. At the first coming, the word of the new wine that people had to consume was the gospel of heaven, which was the new and revealed word of the fulfillment of the Old Testament. There was also the old wine that people had been drinking until the new wine came, which was the law of Moses. Satan's wine of adulteries that people should not have consumed at the first coming was the words preached by the Pharisees and priests at that time. But what is really important to us is a time of the second coming that we are living in. The word of the new wine we must consume at the second coming is the new, revealed word of the fulfillment of the New Testament. It is described in Revelation chapter 10, 
that an angel from heaven brings the revealed word, a little scroll that lay open in his hand. The gospel of the first coming, the fulfillment of the Old Testament, is the old wine that had been drunk for a long time. And the wine of adulteries you and I must watch out for is the false teachings and commentaries that Satan's pastors give. Now, let us take a look at the meaning of wineskin that holds wine. Wineskin is a type of a vessel that holds food made out of various materials. This is the physical characteristic of a vessel. In order for us to understand the meaning of the figurative wineskin and vessel, we can see in Acts chapter 9, verse 15, that Jesus refers to Apostle Paul as a chosen vessel of Jesus to bear Jesus' name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. I'm sure you have many bowls and vessels in your home too. Do you think Apostle Paul was a physical bowl? No, right? Just as we put physical food in bowls, the spiritual food of God's Word is put inside of Apostle Paul's heart. Apostle Paul can be described as a figurative vessel. So the meaning of the figurative wineskin is a person's heart. And there are two kinds of spiritual wineskins. One is an old wineskin and another is a new wineskin. Let us see what the old and new wineskins mean at the first coming together. It's easy to understand the meaning of a wineskin once we understand the meaning of wine inside the wineskin. We can see in Luke chapter 5, verses 37 to 39, that the old wine of the first coming is the law of Moses, and its new wine is a new revealed word of the Old Testament's fulfillment. If the law of Moses is the old wine, wouldn't the people who held this old wine inside of themselves become the old wineskins? The reality of the old wineskins at the first coming was the priests of their time. Then, as the new revealed word of the fulfillment of the Old Testament is the new wine, people who held this new word inside them are the new wineskins. The reality of the new wineskins at the first coming was Jesus and his disciples. Jesus and the disciples became the new wineskins, and they had the new revealed word of the fulfillment of the Old Testament. But they didn't keep it to themselves, but they preached it to the people who did not know it. If the hearts and souls of the priests of that time were old and corrupt when they heard the revealed word, they cannot keep the revealed word inside. This is like how a wineskin bursts and ruins the wine too. But Jesus and his disciples weren't the only new wineskins at the first coming. Mainly, there was a person named Paul who was also a new wineskin. You can see in Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 to 9, that Paul was faultless in legalistic righteousness and persecuted the church zealously. However, after meeting Jesus on his way to Damascus, he said that he considered the law of Moses, which he had cherished for a long time, like rubbish, and threw it away. The law of Moses 
was the old wine as it was cherished for a long time. And the knowledge of having known Jesus, the revealed word, was the new wine. By reflecting on Paul's life, we must discern if the words you're listening to now are of old wine or new wine. If they are the new wine, please become the new wineskins that could hold the words of this new wine instead of the old wineskins. The old and new wineskins also appear at the second coming. We can go to Revelation chapter 10, verses 1 to 2 to find out their meanings, where it says that an angel comes with a little scroll that lay open. Since it's open, it must be a revealed book, right? This revealed book is the new wine. A person then appears to receive and eat the revealed book that has been opened. And it was John, according to verses 8 to 10, who received and ate this little scroll from the angel. Then, this John must be a new wineskin that received the revealed word, which is the new wine. However, this word is not meant to be kept to oneself, but it must be preached to those who do not know. We can see in verse 11 that he must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. So if these peoples, nations, languages, and kings also receive the revealed word through this shepherd who is like John, they too can be called the new wineskins. Regarding the new wineskins, it says in Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 to 10, that there is a new song that people sing. The content of the new song is that the kingdom and priests who were purchased with Jesus' blood appear. What is the meaning of Jesus' blood? It says in Luke chapter 22, that when Jesus was commemorating the Passover with his disciples, he referred to the cup of wine he was holding to the new covenant made with his blood. Ultimately, Jesus' blood refers to the new wine. And those who consume this new wine among the people's nations, languages, and kings, and come out become God's kingdom and priests. Now, let us take a look at the reality of the old and new wineskins at the second coming together. Finding out the meaning of wine that goes inside the wineskin can help us understand. The old wine at the second coming is the first coming's gospel of the Old Testament fulfillment, and the new wine is a new, revealed word of the New Testament's fulfillment. Since the gospel of the Old Testament's fulfillment at the first coming is the old wine, the old wineskins that held this wine are today's pastors of the churches of tradition. Then, if the revealed word of the New Testament's fulfillment is the new wine, who are the new wineskins that have the new wine? They are the promised shepherd, New John, and the new priests of the twelve tribes. New John is the promised shepherd, and the new priests of the twelve tribes are the ones who have the revealed word. But this word, too, must be given to those who do not know it yet. If the pastors of the churches of tradition are old 
and corrupt in their heart and soul when they hear the revealed word from the promised shepherd and the priests, they cannot hold the revealed word inside, and their wineskins would burst with the wine spilled over on the ground. Let me summarize what we've gone over so far. The reality of the new wineskins at the first coming was Jesus and his disciples. The old wineskins were the priests of that time. But what is really important for you and me is this time of the second coming. The reality of the new wineskins at the second coming is new John, who is the promised shepherd, and the new priests of the twelve tribes. The old wineskins at the second coming are today's pastors of the churches of tradition. Up until now, we've learned about the meaning of the figurative wine and the wineskin in which the wine is poured. We will take a look at the meaning of the figurative olive oil together now. Let us read from Revelation chapter 6, verse 6 together as our main reference. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures, saying, A quart of wheat for a day's wages, and three quarts of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. We can see in Revelation chapter 6, verse 6, that these four living creatures appear. They are the four archangels of heaven who are in charge of war and judgment. Their appearance is for the purpose of fulfilling the work of judgment, and Revelation chapter 6 is what testifies to it. It says not to damage the oil and the wine there. And since we've already understood the meaning of wine, we'll think about the meaning of the figurative olive oil. The physical characteristic of the olive oil is that it comes from olives, the fruit of the olive tree. We can see in Leviticus chapter 24 verses 1 to 4 to further understand this meaning. There were seven golden lampstands at the time of Moses that lit up the darkness in the tabernacle and they used olive oil to light these lamps. We can also see in Zechariah chapter 4, verses 1 to 4, where Zechariah sees a vision. In the midst of his vision, he sees seven golden lampstands. Zechariah asked an angel about their meaning. And the angel said that the seven golden lampstands are the eyes of God. In the Bible, the eyes refer to the spirits. So, the seven golden lampstands Moses made on earth came from what was seen from heaven, the seven spirits. It also says in verse 11 to 14, that Zechariah sees two olive trees on the right and left of the seven golden lampstands. Zechariah asked the angel about these two olive trees too. And the angel said that the olive trees are the two anointed ones. When it says that they're anointed, it means that they've been especially chosen by God and were separated. But we should look at a few more verses to clearly understand the meaning of the figurative olive tree and olive oil. To find out in more detail, we can see in Revelation chapter 11, verses 3 to 4, that the two witnesses are described to be the two olive trees. And what comes out of these two olive trees is the olive oil. Then, what should come out of the two witnesses? Should it be the actual olive oil? 
No, right? Since they are the witnesses, what is testified from their mouths should be the word of testimony, and that is the olive oil. Then, why are they described as the two witnesses? We can see from how it's expressed in Revelation chapter 10 that an angel from heaven comes with the little open scroll and there's a shepherd who receives and eats that scroll. He is John. And there's a person who helps John by his side. They are the two witnesses as described in Revelation chapter 11. Although it seems like the two witnesses work together from the beginning to the end, but it says in Revelation chapter 22 verse 8 that John is the one who heard and saw these things. These things here refer to the events that happen across the book of Revelation. And we can see that John is the only shepherd who sees, hears, and testifies to the events after seeing them at their location, not several people. We can also see in verse 16 that a messenger of Jesus who is sent for the churches appears, and he testifies to these things, which are the events of Revelation. We can see that John mentioned in Revelation chapter 22 verse 8 and Jesus' messenger mentioned in verse 16 are ultimately the same person. Let us also take a look at another parable that we must understand in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. In Matthew chapter 25 verses 1 to 13, Jesus tells a parable of the ten virgins describing what heaven will be like at that time. When it says at that time in Matthew chapter 25, it actually continues from Matthew chapter 24. And Matthew chapter 24 is regarding the time of the second coming. Therefore, Matthew chapter 25 is also regarding the time of the second coming when Jesus returns. And this parable of the ten virgins are about receiving Jesus, the bridegroom, at that time. However, the ten virgins do not behave the same way while they wait for Jesus, who is the bridegroom. The wise virgins had lamps, and they had enough oil too. This is why they were able to receive Jesus. However, the foolish ones had lamps, but not enough oil. They start to run out of oil while waiting for Jesus. And when they ran out of oil, they asked the wise virgins to share their oil. However, the wise virgins tell them that they do not have enough for both, so they should go buy oil from the one who sells oil. While the foolish virgins were gone to buy oil, Jesus the bridegroom comes. And the wise virgins enter the wedding banquet, while the foolish ones do not. Then, shouldn't we understand why there is such a difference in result? It comes down to oil. Whether you've prepared enough oil or not can determine you taking part in the wedding banquet. Have you prepared enough of this oil? What is this oil? Is it referring to actual and literal oil? Let's first take a look at the meaning of a lamp in order to understand the meaning of oil. 
We can see in Psalm 119.105 that lamps in the Bible refer to God's Word. As it says that God's Word is a lamp to our feet and a light for our path. It also says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, that we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, and it is like a lamp shining in a dark place. Ultimately, the meaning of the figurative lamp is God's word, and it is the prophecy. But a lamp cannot be lit alone. Oil is necessary to light it, isn't it? The meaning of the figurative oil is a word of testimony that comes from a witness. The lamp is the Bible, and the oil is a word of testimony of a witness. Therefore, we can see the kingdom of heaven that has been promised when we hear the word of testimony testified by the witness who preaches what he has seen and heard at the location of the events. This is how we can enter the kingdom of heaven that has been promised. Just like how a lamp lights our path in darkness, the word of testimony given by the witness who saw the events of the fulfillment of Revelation, the fulfillment of its prophecies, can guide us to discover and enter the kingdom of heaven of promise. This is what we must understand. The foolish virgins asked the wise virgins to share some of their oil. But the wise virgins advised them to buy oil from the one who sells it. Then, who is the person that sells oil? And where is that oil sold? If this oil were physical oil, it must be a gas station where we can be filled with this oil, right? It's not that Jesus told us this parable so we can go to the nearest gas station. Ultimately, the one who sells oil is Jesus' witness. I hope everyone here meets Jesus' witness and prepare enough of this oil so that we can be the children of heaven who receive Jesus, our bridegroom. Let's go over what we've discussed so far today. The figurative new wine of today, the time of Jesus' second coming, is the new revealed word of the New Testament's fulfillment. And the new wineskins are the promised shepherd, who is New John, and the new priests of the Twelve Tribes. I hope we can be the new wineskins who have the new wine, as we empty out the old wine and the wine of adulteries. The figurative olive tree is a witness, and the olive oil is a witness's word of testimony. I hope everyone here will meet the witness who sees, hears, and testifies to Revelation's prophecies and their fulfillment, light our lamp, and receive our Lord who returns. What we must know is that the secrets of heaven are recorded in parables. We must understand the parables to enter the kingdom of heaven that has been promised. We are able to clearly testify to the parables because we have the physical entities of the fulfillment that appeared as they were promised. I hope everyone will clearly perceive to become the people of heaven. Next time, we'll have a more awesome and skillful instructor to hear more about the testimony of God's Word. Please join us next time, too, to share a moment of perception together. We are one within God and Jesus. We are one. We'll finish the lesson here with a prayer. Father God, we truly thank you. It is by your grace that you allowed us to have this seminar 
of testimony on the parables of the secrets of heaven and their true meanings, and we thank you for guiding many of your children who love you here. Please take hold of the hearts of all those who came. Today, we've studied your word with a lesson titled Introductory Lesson 14, The Figurative New Wine, New Wine Skin, and Olive Oil. Let your word be our path and life so we can be the new wineskins who have the new wine in us. Also, fill us up with the olive oil, which is the word of testimony testified by the witness, so we can be guided to the wedding banquet of heaven by understanding all of the parable's meanings through today's fulfillment. Please guide everyone's heart to meet again next time and protect them spiritually and physically until we do so. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for listening until the very end. In the books of prophecies in the Bible, there are the spiritual mountain, rock, and idol that are borrowed from their physical characteristics. What are their true meanings? Which mountain should we go to? We must go to the mountain of salvation, right? Aren't we curious to find out which mountain this mountain of salvation is? Shall we find out from Jesus' words? Then, who is him who overcomes who received the white stone of judgment? You have just heard Introductory Lesson 14, The Figurative New Wine, New Wineskin, and Olive Oil as a part of Shincheonji Online Seminar, Testimony on the Parables of the Secrets of Heaven and Their True Meanings. Pastors who are listening to these words from all over the world now, and the congregation members who believe in God, we are reading the same words of the Bible under God. Though our ethnicity, language, and country of origin may be different, our sincere heart of loving God's Word is the same. And I do believe that God's Word of truth is one. The twelve tribes of Shincheonji desire to live in the kingdom of heaven, the place of freedom, peace, and love, where there is no sin or law with God with us. We desire to carry out our life of faith by sharing the word of truth with everyone from around the world. Many pastors and theology schools that recognize our sincerity have signed MOU with us, Shincheonji, for a continued biblical and cultural relationship. Shincheonji is open to anyone who loves God's Word. Pastors who earnestly desire to sign MOU with us after hearing our teaching from this seminar series can contact us by calling the numbers on the screen. I would like to sincerely thank the pastors and congregation who have joined us until the very end once again. I hope you will continue to follow our seminar series and join us next time too.